Hello and welcome to Undercommon Taste. This is a podcast where we create and discuss homebrew content for tabletop RPGs. We can rebuild them better, faster, stronger. We have the technology. I'm Ian Woodworth. I'm joined by my co-host James Daly. And today we're going over another chunk of the new rules for the 2024 rule set of D&D 5th edition. Last week we talked about some of the general rules changes that were happening in the game, some of the rules that were being removed from the player's handbook, ostensibly going to be added to the Dungeon Master's Guide. And then today we're going to be talking a little bit more about the player facing stuff. So we're going to talk about the changes to spell casting, the weapon mastery properties, because that is a new thing that they're adding that a lot of the martial classes are going to start taking advantage of. And then we're going to talk about the base classes themselves and what things have been changed in the base classes. We're not going to get into subclasses because there are 48 of them and <laughs> I don't need to be editing a four hour episode right now. Twitter though. I will say honestly with what they've done with weapon mastery, I'm really excited to see this on the table and it's almost enough to make me want to play a smashy character. Yeah, it feels good. It does. It really does. So let's go ahead and just dive right in. All right, both feet. Yeah. So going to talk a little bit at the beginning here about spellcasting. Spellcasting has gotten a decent overhaul. A lot of spells have been modified, updated. One of the big ones that I noticed was that the healing spells, cure wounds, and healing word have been upped to two dice at first level from one die. Yeah, so particularly the healing spells, but a lot of the spells got just an overall buff with this update. Yeah, and there there are some other things that have been clarified in rule text and a couple of other changes that have happened. One that I am aware of is Fireball no longer goes around corners. Oh, interesting. Makes yeah, sense. They, they remove that snippet from the line of rules text. Nice. So it, it no longer goes around corners. Um, okay, I like it. A couple things I've seen with spells that I think, you know, they've gone and clarified, you know, there was the longstanding question of whether or not grease was flammable. Um, yes, and they have I, clarified that grease is not flammable. And things like shocking grasp, where before someone that you use shocking grasp with, they couldn't take a reaction. Now it is just they cannot take attacks of opportunity. I've been reading some things saying that other things like layer actions, those are considered reactions now. So it looks like there's some wiggle room and a little bit of change to what a reaction is going to be and what exactly you can do with reactions. Yeah. And going back to the YouTube channel I was talking about last time, uh, Treant Monk's Temple, Chris over there released four videos specifically talking about changes to spells like bringing up specific spells and talking about how they were changed from the 2014 to the 2024 or spells that the community thought should be changed that weren't. Like I said, there's four half hour videos. So if you want to go and investigate specific spells, I recommend going over and watching that. This said, one thing they did with the spells with the book, again, I think a brilliant move from Wizards and a great idea. Pre fifth edition, fourth edition, third edition. When you wanted to look up a spell, it was just all the way in the back. It was all the spells were kind of grouped and then they broke down into class spells. And it was really inconvenient and cumbersome to find the spell you were looking for, especially if you're trying to figure out what spells for your class. And now... Class spells are contained within the class description chapter. And I think that's a really solid move. So you can look and see exactly what spells your player class has available to you. Yeah, that's one thing that I really like, too, is that if you're wanting to play a cleric, the cleric spell list is listed in the cleric section of character creation. And that really should have been done decades ago. Yeah, really. Really, yeah. But there were also some just general overhaul changes to spellcasting. First off, and the thing that I'm most excited about, is that everybody that has spellcasting gets it at first level. Huzzah! That includes halfcasters. So your paladins and your rangers now get their spells at first level too. I kind of like this. Part of me does yearn for that 
first and second edition, particularly for the clerics, you know, and you had to be at least second level before you got any of your spells. And I mean, from playing from like your average villager to a hero, that would make sense. And again, that was more the feel of first, second, and third edition. Fifth edition very much has the superhero feel. So you start off already kind of heroic and, you know, definitely a tier or three better than the average villager. So at that point, if you already have spells and like you woke up and bam, you have spells, it kind of has an X-Men feel to it. Or, you know, you just wake up and all of a sudden you've got these abilities. I can see it storytelling wise, you know, it's good. But part of me does kind of want to go back to those older like you had to earn your stripes. I mean, there's nothing saying that you can't do that in your home game. But I think that the demographic who is playing 5th edition doesn't want that game style. I think that the people who are wanting that particular game style have already transitioned over into the OSR community. Yeah, probably. Again, I'm old. (laughs) Yeah. And that is absolutely the sort of vibe that you can get out of an OSR game because they're built off of that first edition AD&D sort of chassis just with the rule set greatly simplified taking out redundancies you know combining yeah, I, things and to making it simple roles and such yeah AD&D was exceptionally clunky yeah but another aspect of spell casting that I wanted to talk about is that now all classes prepare spells You didn't used to have this. You had some classes that prepared spells, which were the cleric, druid, and wizard. And then you had others who just had innate spellcasting who knew their spells. That would be your bard and your sorcerer and your warlock. And then I think rangers had known spells and paladins had prepared spells. Yeah, I'm largely okay with this. I do like the feel, especially of a sorcerer, having innate magic just kind of like it's within them. Particularly when you deal with things like wild magic and stuff like that. It feels correct. I don't mind, you know, everyone being on the same page. Okay, you have to prepare your spells. But it will make a little bit more difficulty kind of distinguishing the sorcerer from the wizard, in my opinion. So the way that they're getting around this At least from my understanding, I haven't been able to find any sort of articles or anything talking about the changes to spellcasting overall. But I think that the way it is working is that the four classes that used to be preparing your spells, so your clerics, druids, wizards, and paladins, they still get the whole class spell list to prepare from at the beginning of the day with the exception of the wizard who has to prepare from their spell book. And then all of the classes that were innate spellcasters, they have a list of spells that they can prepare just like they used to, like a known spells list. But then they're able to swap out one spell every long rest or one spell every level off of that list. Gotcha. I've not seen specifically the sorcerer thing. I do need to look that up. Uh, For that, I would feel better if it was once per level where a sorcerer would be able to swap out or a wizard would be able to swap out once per rest because, you know, they have knowledge of the spell plus they're preparing from a known spell book versus, again, it's whatever innate talent the sorceress or the bard would have. Yeah, and I think that it is a once per level you can swap out one spell on your list for a new spell. I um, like that. And that kind of has that feel from like early third edition with Neverwinter Nights. If I recall the sorcerer, what you were able, only able to swap during level up. Right. And so I, I like this because it makes it uniform across all of your classes. You know, you can have more spells that you know, more spells that you have access to in the long term than you have access to today. And you have the ability to have spells that are very niche that you only pick up on days when you know you're going to need that very specific thing. And, you know, you have your default loadout for everything else. And Um, I I, I like that feel. And I like the fact that it makes all of the spellcasting classes mechanically more similar to make it easier for players to go from one caster class to another on different characters without having to basically learn a whole new 
spell casting formula. Right. No, I do get that. I can follow that. And for newer players, it's a lot easier to explain. Okay, you just have to prepare your spells at the beginning of the day versus, okay, you propel your skills at the beginning of the day. You don't, you do, you don't, and you don't. And it's like, well, why not? And it's like, well, it's just a character. And that can be confusing to a newer player. So I don't mind everyone being on the same page. That said, this also takes away, I've known several players to like multi-class wizard and sorcerer just because the sorcerer or sorceress did have certain feats like metamagic or because they did have those innate casting abilities, they were always prepared. And it was a utility thing, but it, it did work when it worked. All right. Well, I think that's most of what I wanted to talk about, about spell casting. Was there anything else that you wanted to bring up? Yeah, there is one thing that I'm actually really excited to see with spell casting. They have a new spell type. This is Emanation, and this is going to work kind of like if you've ever played something like World of Warcraft, Warcraft 3, Dungeon Siege, an old Microsoft game. It, it, this is basically going to work like an aura. These spells emanate from the caster in a straight line, 360 degrees for a range. Uh, so like I said, this is basically creating an effect bubble around your character. And I think the use of these will be very interesting to see how how they're going to be used. Yeah, and I mean, most of these were spells that were already considered aura spells yeah. or aura effects and they've just sort of standardized the language around them right now with this because it is a straight line and i would need to look more in depth i don't know again something like corners or line of sight would cause an interruption and again at that point if you have a dm that really wants to build some interesting battle maps for your character so maybe you're fighting like in an old temple or ruins and so there's pillars or rocks in the way that you have to move around if that's interrupting your emanation. That could be a really interesting battle effect for the party to deal with. Yeah. Okay. So the other thing I wanted to talk about before we got into the classes was the new weapon mastery properties. Oh, very excited. Yeah, these are great because it gives that extra bit of tactical effect to marshals that they didn't have before. And in a way that makes weapon choice matter. Yeah, and this makes weapon mastery feel like you've mastered the weapon. And earlier, yeah, I have weapon mastery. And so what? You know, it was very lackluster, but this feels like something. This can be used. Yeah. And so the way that this is working is that if you're playing a martial class, you will have the ability to... It's basically a separate attunement system. You're setting up a number of proficient weapons to basically gain the mastery properties of those weapons, which means that whenever you use that weapon, you're allowed to use its mastery property. Each weapon has its own mastery property, and that will allow you to add additional effects to your attacks. And I happen to have a list of them here with, with some examples of the weapons that they're on. So the first one is Cleave, which is on the Great Axe. So if you hit a creature with an attack, you can make a second attack against another creature within five feet. And on a hit, you just deal the weapons damage die. You don't get to add your modifier unless it's negative. Yeah. So, yeah, this is that great bringing back the cleave feet from third edition, you know, that ability to deal AOE damage with your weapon, diving into that mob of squishy targets, you know, throwing yourself into the target rich environment and laying waste about you. Yes. Again, I'm going to reference order of the stick, but you know, just a field of kobolds and going through now with this, is it per hit? Because in third edition, you actually had to kill the opponent to get the extra. Yes, it is per hit. Per hit. Oh, yeah. So again, if, if you're wading through a field of gnomes or kobolds and you're just going to, you're going to be the lawnmower, man. It's going to be wonderful. Yeah. I, like I said, they have really upped the power fantasy feel oh, yeah. of the game with the new rule set. I really need to go back and read order this deck. I might resume that or restart that tonight. Yeah. Next one is Graze, which is on the Great Sword, which if you miss a creature with an attack, you still deal damage equal to your ability modifier. I like this one. This one, you no matter what you're doing, a little bit of damage. This makes me feel 
good. I could see myself using this weapon frequently. Yeah. The next one, and this is one that has already had a lot of rules conversation around it. The Nick property, which is on the dagger. So the wording of it is when you make an attack with a light weapon while dual wielding, you may make a second attack with another light weapon. And a weapon with Nick allows you to do this without spending your bonus action. So you get a second attack on your attack action. But if you do that, it doesn't allow you to make a second attack as a bonus action, which is weird. That is a bit weird. So and then it works weird with the two weapon fighting feet. So basically two weapon fighting lets you do this in a way that, you know, you get to add your modifier to the offhand attack and it lets you do it with your primary weapon not being light, I think. It is very confusing. That would make sense. So for Nick, you would use the second attack, but it wouldn't be an offhand attack, so you'd still get your weapon attack bonus. So instead of like main hand attack, offhand attack without the bonus, you just have two main hand attacks. No, this this is letting you, you have to be wielding two light weapons. Okay. And the Nick property lets you make an attack with the offhand weapon as part of your attack action. Right. So right. you're making your main hand and offhand attack as part of the attack action. Right. But what I'm saying is that you get your weapon bonuses and stuff with the offhand attack. So it's like making two main hand attacks versus the yeah. main hand okay. and then that. And then if you get the two weapon fighting feet, you don't have to have Nick on your weapon. You don't have to have a light weapon. You could have something like a short sword or, you know. A short sword a- is light. Oh, a long sword or whatever. You could have two heavier weapons where you could do the same thing. I think that's how that works out. Again, a little convoluted, but I can almost see a thread through there. And I think the intent behind this is because the classes that are going to be using weapons like daggers are going to be rogues. Yes. And this frees up your bonus action to do one of the many other things that rogues can do. This lets you use your dash, disengage, hide, dodge, all that stuff on your bonus action after having made your attacks. That said, I could see, again, a sorcerer or a wizard, if they have like a cantrip that's a bonus action cantrip, they should be proficient with daggers. So they use the nick. They get the second attack with their dagger because Lord knows your wizard and sorcerer should be in melee. And then they can use their bonus action for their cantrip spell. All right. Next up is push, which is on the great club. So when you hit a creature, you can push them up to 10 feet away from you in a straight line. The target does not get a save on this forced movement. You just push them. I like this. I wonder if there's going to be damage rules. So if you push them into a wall that's only five feet away or two feet away, if they're going to take that force damage like they would from falling. Again, obviously pushing people off a cliff or into, you know, like, what is it, spiky growth or thorn growth or something like that, that people have been talking about quite a bit. This can be used well mechanically, I think. Oh, yes. Next up is sap, which is on the mace. So when you hit a creature, it has disadvantage on the next attack it makes before the start of your next turn. I like this one. I really do. Though I want a giant wooden club with sap, and it's not the disadvantage. It just makes them sticky. (laughs) (laughs) You would. Maybe a little mosquito in there and get some amber for Jurassic Park. Mm. Uh, Next is slow, which is on the light crossbow. So when you hit a creature, its speed is reduced by 10 feet until the start of your next turn. This is beautifully tactical. I would love to see a party behind a barricade and like three or four players shooting with light crossbows for slow just to get an extra round or two of arrows before they break into melee. I think this can be a lot of fun to use. and This would be really good to see on the battle map. Yeah, and this particular weapon property is going to work really well with the reworked um, assassin rogue. Oh, yeah. Like I said, we're not going to go into the details of the (laughs) subclasses, but just trust me on this. This works really well with that. Two more left. First one is topple, which is on the mall. So when you hit a creature, it has to succeed on a con save or fall prone. That can be just absolutely devastating. I know, especially in third edition, um, your ranger, if you had a wolf pet, if you had a druid and you had like a wolf companion, 
one of the big reasons to pick the wolf was it had the trip mechanic, which was the same thing. Because once the creature is down, if it's toppled or prone, everybody has advantage on melee attacks. And so if you can knock the big bad down, then everyone just kind of jumps in and starts stomping on it. Uh, you can do a lot of damage really fast. Yeah. And this is great, especially once you start getting to higher levels and you have extra attacks. Oh, yeah. Because then you smack it with your maul, you knock it down, and then you, with your follow-up attacks, beat him on the ground with this maul. Absolutely. And just just the visual of that's great. <laughs> that said, I also foresee a lot of DMs using more monsters that have immunity to prone. Yeah. I can see that too. And then the final one is Vex, which is on the short sword. And this is one that I really want to see the rules text on for clarification. The way that it works now is when you hit a creature with an attack, the next attack you make before the end of your next turn has advantage. Again, this would be good for the dual weapon fighting, or if you have more than one attack action per turn, this can be very useful. It's almost going to feel like a witch's bolt. Or not, not Witch's Bolt, but um, Guiding Strike. You're confusing them again. It's Guiding oh, Bolt. Guiding Bolt, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Um, so many but, spells. But the reason I want to see the actual text on this one is I'm not sure if it is advantage on your next attack against that target or against any target. Oh, good question. Because it makes sense if it's against that target. It doesn't yeah. make as much sense if it's against any target. Fair. But yeah, that's something we'll have to wait until the book comes out and I can actually read it. Yeah, but that said, with these mastery feats, I really almost do want to play a smashy character just to play with a handful of them. These are kind of exciting. Like I said, I really like Topple. I think Cleave could be just a ton of fun. Those are the two that really kind of jump at me. Slow is super important, I think. It would be very critical in some aspects. And so the one thing that I remember hearing a lot coming up whenever people were talking about these weapon mastery feats. They're not feats, sorry. These weapon mastery properties is that specifically with the topple feature, you want to be using a weapon that does not have reach for this because you only get advantage on that melee attack if you are within five feet. Oh, fair. If you are not within five feet, even if it's a melee attack with a reach weapon, that attack has disadvantage Ew. against a prone target. That said, the rest of the party would get advantage. And so it's not, I mean, while you get advantage is nice, giving the party advantage, I think, is a bit juicier. Yeah, but it's only advantage on melee attacks yes. Yeah, if they're prone. Correct. Anyway, we've been talking for half an hour at this <laughs> point. We need to get on to the actual topic of the classes. Okay. You know, the reason why we were going to have this episode in the first place. Uh, So we will start at the top and go alphabetically through, starting with the Barbarian. Rage has been reworked on the Barbarian. You can now maintain your rage as a bonus action or by forcing an enemy to make a save. I like this. This, again, makes the rage a little bit more durable for the player. And, I mean, it does make for a little bit of a thinky Barbarian, which... I mean, you can have some intelligent barbarians. I don't see why not, but I do like having the rage a little bit more durable. I don't know. I don't think it makes them much more thinky. It makes it easier for you to utilize your rage. It means that you don't have to be tactical with your rage. The thing that you do is you bonus action rage at the beginning of every combat. And if you end up not getting up in something's face... If they end up getting too far away from you to where you can't close the distance on a turn, you don't have to run the risk of losing your rage because you can just use your bonus action, which, let's face it, barbarians aren't doing anything with their bonus action except for raging. Fair. (laughs) To maintain their rage. Fair point. Especially since now, you also regain one use of rage at the end of each short rest. I like that too. So it makes it a much more usable thing. It makes it something that you're not penalized if you use it and then the combat didn't really need it. 
And then you end up going into the next room where the big bad is, but you're out of rages. And so now you feel kind of impotent as a barbarian. Yeah, that happens. <laughs> yeah. If your rage lasts for more than four hours, please consult your doctor. Um, please, please consult your cleric. Yes. yes. <laughs> they also gain weapon mastery at the first level. They start off with the ability to have access to two weapon mastery properties of melee weapons, specifically melee weapons. But because thrown weapons are considered melee weapons with the thrown property, you can absolutely gain the weapon mastery property of like a hand axe or a javelin. I like it. That too, I also kind of want to huck my war club at somebody. Just like club to the face. Danger sense at second level no longer requires you to be able to see or hear the threat to gain the benefits of danger sense. That seems fair. That was one of those things that was a big oversight, I think, is that if you happen to drop darkness or silence over top of an area where the barbarian happened to be, suddenly they didn't get their danger sense anymore. Yeah, no, and It was so supposed to be funny. this sort of supernatural feel to it. And this allows it to continue having that supernatural ability feel to it. Yeah, no, I totally agree with this. At third level, they have now primal knowledge. So you gain proficiency with one skill of your choice. I think it's off of the list of acrobatics, intimidation, perception, stealth, and survival. Yeah, I have no issue with that at all. And while raging, you can use your strength modifier for skill checks with these skills. Thematically, that makes sense. Yes, you can strength modifier rage stealth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that one's a little thing. I was more thinking like strength modifier an intimidation or something like that, which again would make sense. Right. At seventh level, you gain instinctive pounce. So when you enter your rage, you get to move up to half your movement. Nice. As part of that bonus action of you raging. I like it. And it helps you get into combat faster. It helps make sure that you can close the distance and actually smash something on your turn. It feels good. It does. It really, really does. Next up at ninth level, they've replaced brutal critical with brutal strikes. And so if you have advantage on an attack, you may choose not to use advantage, but instead get a D10 of extra damage plus an additional benefit. This feels good, too. I think this just feels very utilitarian. But I mean, sometimes it's about hitting hard. Right. And so the two options that you get for starters are forceful blow, which lets you push a target up to 15 feet, then move up to half your speed towards them without provoking attacks of opportunity or hamstring blow, which reduces the target's speed by 15 feet until the start of your next turn. I like this one too, especially if like they're already in difficult terrain and you hamstring them and now their move speed is zero. It's not zero because difficult terrain just takes twice as much, much. movement. Okay. Fair. Okay, so yeah. you're basically reducing them to like five feet. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, that would yeah. make more sense because uh, then you start getting like things like restrained properties and stuff like that because your movement speed would be yeah. zero and that would be a little loophole -y. Next is at 11th level, they've reworked Relentless Rage. So instead of now, if you're reduced to zero hit points while raging, you bounce back up with one hit point. You now instead get two times your barbarian level hit points on Ooh. a successful con save. I like it. Because there wasn't anything that felt a whole lot worse than, you know, taking this big hit, succeeding on your con save, popping back up at one hit point, and then something sneezes on you when you go down. There, yeah. You, you get blinked at by the dust method. Yeah. <laughs> at 13th level, it's improved brutal strikes. So you get two more brutal strike options. You get staggering blow. So the target gets disadvantage on its next saving throw and can't make attacks of opportunity until the start of your next turn. This is one where you smack them with this and then you get out of the way. <laughs> yes. And you let the wizard fireball. Yeah. And then the other one is thundering blow, which I really like. The next attack against the target gets a plus five bonus to hit. Ooh, especially if you've got like a rogue ready to backstab. And so you hit him with that thundering blow and now you just like make sure that rogue hits with backstab. That could put out some damage real, real fast. Yeah, and I like that they made it a plus five bonus to hit, which mathematically is the same as advantage. But yes. they're not giving you advantage because 
that allows you to get advantage from somewhere else because there are lots of ways to get advantage. Right. So like again, going back to our rogue example, if the rogue is hidden, they're going to have advantage and they would need advantage for that backstab anyway. So now, they're, now they have advantage with plus five on both die. They're almost certainly going to hit. Well, they only get plus five on the first one. Oh, okay. I thought it's, I it's about the next five. attack. Well, the next attack, but if you're attacking with advantage, you still roll 2d20s. Right, yeah. So you but get you, plus five on each die. Right. Because it's advantage, yeah. Yeah, that's not what I was hearing whenever you said that. I've, oh, okay. I was hearing multiple attacks. No, no, okay. no. Okay, now that we're on the same page. We turn it. Uh, level 15, you get persistent rage. So your rage now lasts 10 minutes and cannot be ended early without you falling unconscious. You can still choose to end your okay. rage. Yeah. But no outside influence can end your rage without knocking you out. I like it. And also, once per long rest, you can choose to regain all of your expended uses of rage whenever you roll initiative. So if you've run out of rages, you can choose once per day, nope, I'm angry. <laughs> I'm not done raging. I am raging about my raging. <laughs> yes. What do you mean I'm out? <laughs> I rage. No, you're out. Well, I rage about not having rages. Yep. And then level 17, you get improved Brutal Strike again. So it improves your damage off of Brutal Strike from 1d10 to 2d10. And you can now inflict two Brutal Strike effects on each hit. I like this. Again, I kind of want to play Barbarian. And then the Capstone Primal Champion at level 20, uh, your Strength and Con now cap out at 25. Ooh, yeah, I really like that. Continuing on to the Bard. As we mentioned earlier, Bards now prepare spells instead of having innate spell casting. Bardic Inspiration has been reworked. Rather than lasting 10 minutes, it now lasts an hour. Nice. And it can now be granted to any creature that can see or hear you. Okay. And it can be rolled after success or failure is determined. You used to have to roll it before. Yeah, no, I like this. And that's one of those things. I want to say it feels a bit more like Smite, where you can declare it when you need it. And again, this has a proper feel to it. And then extending that out, you know, the time that you can use it out so you can use it at the proper time or in the proper scenario just feels correct. Yeah. And I mean, it gives the right feeling for inspiration, right? Absolutely, yeah. You know, because you have to have the reason to be inspired, if that makes sense. Oh, no, Absolutely. And I don't see any better reason than, you know, you failed your saving throw and then they inspire you. So you pull through and you actually succeed. Yeah. Yeah. Expertise has been shifted one level earlier. So you now get your first expertise at level two instead of level three and your second one at level nine instead of level 10. Minor change, but it's a shift. Yeah. Song of Rest has been removed. Just gotten rid of entirely there are other class abilities i think subclass abilities that will have additional effects that will let you do similar things yeah but the song of rest in and of itself has been removed and it goes poof it goes poof so font of inspiration a fifth level you can expend a spell slot to regain uses of your bardic inspiration so if you're, Again, not, not a bad. Yeah. So if you're out of inspiration and you just really need an inspiration right now, you can blow a spell slot to get Bardic Inspiration. No, I, and I'm perfectly okay with that. I mean, again, that feels correct for a Bard. Really, their big push should be inspiration versus magical ability. Yeah. So level seven, Counter Charm. It got pushed from level six back to level seven and has been reworked. So you can now use counter charm as a reaction it used to be an action and you can use it after a creature fails a saving throw versus being charmed or frightened. It used to be an action that lasted one round and it gave all of the affected creatures advantage against being charmed or frightened. I like this. This kind of has that schoolyard like you've got you're in the middle and both sides are convincing you that they're right or to do, you know, whatever the thing is for them type thing or almost like a rap battlefield kind of. Yeah, this is fun. I like it. Yeah. And basically what it does is it will allow the affected creature or creatures to re-roll that saving throw that they failed. Yeah. Next up, Magical Secrets, level 10. It now specifies that you 
can pick spells from the cleric, druid, and wizard spell lists. Um, it used to be any class, and, it yeah. let, and that lets you pick up things like Eldritch Blast. <laughs> Maybe a little opied. Yeah, and so that was something that got nixed. And it used to just let you pick two spells from another spell list. But this one allows you, I think, to pick and choose from these various spell lists whenever they are preparing their spells. So that means that they can draw from all of these to really just build a huge customized toolkit for exactly the situation that they're going into. Yeah. And that said, you know, a Bard Warlock multiclass is still extremely useful and a lot of fun. Yeah. Next up, Superior Inspiration. It used to be their capstone level 20 feature. It has been bumped down to level 18. And now whenever you roll initiative, if you have no Bardic Inspiration left, you gain two uses. It used to be one. Makes sense. And then finally, Words of Creation, their capstone ability at level 20. You always have Power Word Heal and Power Word Kill prepared. And on top of that, if you use one of these two spells... They're ninth level spells. They do still take a spell slot, so you can only cast one of them a day. But if you use one of these spells, you can also target a second creature within 10 feet of your initial target. That's beefy. Yeah. Being able to just drop power word kill on two creatures at the same time. Yeah. I mean, even power word heal. I mean, that's uh, two party members is wow you get the paladin and the barbarian that are you know on their last legs right up in the boss's face and you drop a power word heal and bring them both back up to full health and clear Mm. all of their uh status effects yeah that would be clutch oh (laughs) (laughs) yeah that'd be great but yeah that's the bard that's the changes that were made for the bard continuing on to cleric cleric At first level gets a divine order. This is something that both the cleric and the druid have that lets you pick, you know, whether you're wanting a more martial or a more spell slinger sort of feel to your character. So for cleric, you get to choose between protector, which gives you proficiency with martial weapons and heavy armor or thaumaturge, which gives you an extra cantrip and it lets you add your wisdom modifier to intelligence arcana and intelligence religion checks which means that on those checks specifically you get to add your intelligence and your wisdom modifiers nice and i like this too this does have kind of like the flip between like your templar which are going to be your more martial knights or like your jesuit priests which are you know definitely a more scholarly type of priests but i love that they've made that distinction a little stronger and feels better thematically yeah So second level channel divinity has been given a glow up. So they used to have a channel divinity that was part of their subclass and turn undead. Those were your options. They've added another option called divine spark. So whenever you use channel divinity to use divine spark, you choose a target within 30 feet and you either heal them 1d8 plus your wisdom or you deal 1d8 plus your wisdom radiant or necrotic damage half on a save. Okay. I like it. And then those values increase to 2d8 at 7th, 3d8 at 13th, and 4d8 at 18th level. Not bad at all. At 5th level, Destroy Undead has been replaced with Seer Undead. So if you attempt to turn undead, any undead who fail their turn undead save end up taking your Wisdom Modifier d8 Radiant Damage. So your Wisdom Modifier plus 1d8? or is No. It like- your wisdom modifier is how many D8s you get. Oh. So, yeah. I mean, this is going to be tricky to get up to 20 this early, but it's easily going to be a 16. Yeah, easily. Possibly even an 18 at this point at 5th level. So that would be 3D8 or 4D8 radiant damage to any undead that fails their saving throw. So it's no longer tied to the CR of the undead. And with that much radiant damage going out, you're probably you're going stuff. to destroy any really low CR undead anyway. Yeah. But this makes it feel better whenever you use it. Absolutely. So level seven, you get Blessed Strikes. So you get to choose one of these two options. You either get Divine Strikes, which makes your weapon attacks deal an additional 1d8 
radiant or necrotic damage. Or you get potent spell casting, which lets you add your wisdom modifier to damage dealt with cleric cantrips. I like that because, again, a plus three or plus four on a cantrip is absolutely nothing to sneeze at. You do something like Toll the Dead where it's going to do half damage on a save, but you're still adding that extra bit and you're, you're still hitting for a good bit with a cantrip. Yeah. Next up is at level 10, Divine Intervention. Divine Intervention has gotten a rework. Okay. Starting at 10th level, once per day, you can just pick a cleric spell of 5th level or lower that is not a reaction, and you get to cast it without using spell components or a spell slot. Well, I like it. Again, depending on the situation, this can be clutch, especially if you're throwing a heal spell or something along those lines when you're having a pocket revivify oh yes every day yep Yep. (laughs) yeah no that that's a that you don't have to spend that 750 gold diamond 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 on (laughs) yeah yeah or 500 gold diamond or however much it is i think it's 500 gold for revivify in greater is a thousand Uh, i think resurrection might be a thousand thousand, yeah but still i mean that true resurrection i think is 2500 maybe yeah But either way, that is a good thing to be able to pull out of your pocket. Yeah. You can also flame strike. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But that's my personal choice. (laughs) I love me some flame strike. Moving on to level 14, you get improved blessed strikes. So with that, either your divine strikes feature damage increases to 2d8 or your potent spell casting gives you temporary HP when you deal damage with a cleric cantrip. Bad. The temporary HP is equal to two times your wisdom modifier, and it can be to yourself or to a target within 60 feet. I like it. So yeah, so you can pop something in the face with a sacred flame and then give like eight to 10 temporary hit points to somebody. Yeah. And again, this is like when your meat shields are right up in the middle of everything, or if you're the meat shield and you're right up in the middle of everything, eight or so extra hit points can make or break the party sometimes. Yeah. And then finally, at level 20, Greater Divine Intervention. This lets you use your Divine Intervention to cast Wish. Oh, well, you know, just as you do. Level 20. Once a day, just Wish. It still has all of the limitations that you get with casting Wish. As in, you know, you might end up burning it out and not being able to cast Wish ever again. Fair. And whenever you do this to cast Wish, you can't use your Divine Intervention again for 2d4 days. That sounds about right. If I remember, it used to be that like you could only use Divine Intervention, I think, like once, once a week. week. Yeah. So, I mean, that 2d4, that's about correct. A maximum of eight days, minimum of two. So, yeah, no, I'm good with that. Yeah. Moving on to the Druid. Yay, Druid. Again, like I said, they, like the Cleric, have this focus split here at first level with Primal Order. You get to choose to either be a Warden and gain proficiency with medium armor and martial weapons or Magician to get an extra cantrip and add your Wisdom modifier to Intelligence Nature or Intelligence Arcana checks. Ooh, that'd be a hard choice, especially with playing Bloop, uh, because I want Bloop to be more tanky, but Bloop is very, very squishy. He is a mushroom. But I like both of these. I would have a hard time picking. Also at first level, Druidic has been modified to give you Speak with Animals. Oh, nice. Just right off the top. Just right off to play into the class fantasy of it. Fair. So at second level, Wild Shape. Wild Shape has gotten a big overhaul. Yeah. It is now a bonus action for everyone. Huzzah. And it also lets you have the option to spend a Wild Shape to summon a Wild Companion. So basically what it does is it lets you use Wild Shape instead of a spell slot to cast Find Familiar. Uh. I'm okay with that. Again, depending on, I'll have to look to more to see how they're, if they're going to change how familiars work in 5th edition. Familiars are a little underwhelming in 5th, so I do need to research familiars a bit more for myself. But I know that they have greatly expanded the list of what is available for a familiar. That is good. But a bonus action wild shape. I could see like running into something, smashing a bunch of stuff up with your action, and then like wild shaping into something with just insane armor class like a tortle or something like that just a hey look i'm invincible 
and just wait till your next turn. I would play something like that. It would allow the druid to become the most efficient thief ever because you could break into a room, rush in, grab the thing, bonus action wild shape into a bird, and then fly out the window with it. Because anything you are carrying gets absorbed into your wild shape. But I would like, I'd wild shape into something like a flea that's so small and beyond notice anyway, and then just boink, just bounce out. I don't know that you can. Okay. Because I think a flea would, I don't think a flea would be considered a beast. Okay. But anyway, additional things. So druids can now continue to speak while in wild shape. You used to not be able to do that. Yeah, I don't know how. That used to be a particular class ability for depending on your circle. And then sometimes it was a feat. I am a little bitter about that one just being handed out. I think it plays into the class fantasy of it. It does, but... Because you're not actually a bear. You're a very magical person who happens to be in the shape of a bear. Fair. I'm not bear. I'm just bear-shaped. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) I'm going to pet that dog. (laughs) I'll pet that dog. (laughs) They have increased the number of uses for Wild Shape. It starts off with two uses per short or long rest. It now goes up to three uses at 6th level and four uses at 17th level. It used to be you had two uses until you hit 20th level, and then you could just do it whenever. Yeah, I like this a little better. Again, it does give more opportunity to use Wild Shape. And I think a lot of this probably has to do with the D&D movie from last year that people are wanting to play that type of character and be able to use that wild shape more frequently. Yeah. Which again, I am okay with that. That feels fun. Yeah. So you no longer assume the hit points and hit dice of your beast shape. You now gain temporary hit points equal to your druid level. And one thing that I do know is that circle of the moon druids end up getting three times their druid level because their whole shtick is wild shape combat. Yeah. And your form no longer breaks if you run out of hit points for it. So if you go through all of your temporary hit points, you don't return to your humanoid shape. You can stay in your beast shape because your beast shape and you all share the same hit points. And so that's going to get rid of those instances where people are choosing the tactically optimal choice based on the number of hit points that they get. Yeah, I'm okay with this. Again, part of me does like trying to pick the tactically optimal. I mean, you still have that option with their abilities and such. It's just that you're not going to have people just picking the brown bear because it has the most hit points for its CR. But who doesn't want to be a big old brown bear? If it's not friend, then why friend shaped? Because sometimes you want different utility. (laughs) No, bear. I don't care if I'm on the high seas or not, bear. So you gain access to a limited number of known forms as well. So starting at level two, whenever you get wild shape, you can have four total forms that you can swap between. Fourth level, it ups to six. At eighth level, it ups to eight. There's no longer a restriction on you can't pick a shape with a swim speed. You still have to get to level eight to get a shape with a fly speed. Fair. But yeah, so now you can transform into a penguin. Yeah, penguin and honestly, something like a crocodile, I think, is always a good option. And I mean, I do enjoy my amphibians and my reptiles as much as Ian does. And so being able to transform into a frog or a lizard or like a crocodile, because they all do have some form of swim speed. So especially if you're in a swamp is very useful. Yeah. And then finally, you can swap out one known form for another after a long rest. I'm okay with that. Now, again, previously the wild shape was just you didn't have known forms, and so you could pick anything within your CR range. So I think well, this does... you had the limitation of you had to have seen it before. Yeah. Which made it very interesting trying to adjudicate that at the table, which is why they have done away with it, I think. Yeah, this does feel correct. Um, like I said, I have no issue with this. Um, It does limit some options, but again, make your players think about their characters a little bit. Uh, It makes for a better game. Okay, so next up is Wild Resurgence. I don't have a level on this because D&D Beyond didn't do a Druid article. 
So I know that this is a thing from the interview with Jeremy Crawford. I don't know what level it is because he didn't say either. But you can spend a spell slot to gain an extra use of Wild Shape. And you can continue to do that for as long as you have spell slots. I'm going to guess this is probably something like 15th level, somewhere around there. No, because they went in chronological order. And so the next thing that they talked about was a 7th level feature. Oh. And so this is... I'm going to guess probably at fifth level, because I think that's at the level where you got the cleric thing. No, where bards get font of inspiration, where they can blow a spell slot to gain a bardic inspiration. And the clerics get their first divine. No, that's when they get seer undead. Okay, when did they get their divine? Channel divinity is the second level. Okay, what's the one where you once they could pull out a free spell from their deity? Tenth level. Tenth level. Okay, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. And then once per day, you can expend a wild shape to gain a first level spell slot. Again, not, not a bad exchange. Yeah, that was their way of balancing that out. So you can pour spell slots into your wild shape all day, but you can't pour your wild shapes into spell slots all day because you get right. your wild shapes back at a short rest and your spell slots at a long rest. Yeah, I'm OK with that. That feels correct. They're, they were trying to get rid of the coffee lock strategy. I'm not you sure would, what that one is. So Coffee Lock is a sorcerer warlock multi-class because you got your spell points and your warlock spell slots back after a short rest. Okay. And so you were able to turn your warlock spell slots into sorcerer spell slots by converting them by filtering them through your spell points. Oh okay. yeah. And it was a way to get extra spells per day. Nice so, loopholes. Yeah. But continuing on, Elemental Fury at level seven, you get to choose between Primal Strike, which lets you add one D eight cold, fire, lightning, or thunder damage onto a melee attack. This like includes it. weapon attacks and wild shape melee attacks. Ooh. This feels very much like a shaman or elementalist, and again for a druid. This does feel correct, too. Yeah, and that's why they picked those four damage types specifically. Cold is water, fire is fire, lightning is air, thunder is earth. Yeah. And then the other option is potent spell casting, which lets you add your wisdom modifier to the damage on a druid cantrip. Nice. And this upgrades to improved elemental fury at 15th level, which is kind of wild. So primal strike, very standard your bonus damage increases from 1d8 to 2d8. Okay. But potent spell casting, your improved potent spell casting increases your cantrip range by 300 feet. Sweet Jeebus. I went the way. And the reason for that is because at 18th level, you get beast spells, which lets you cast spells while in your wild shape. That's, um... That lets you transform into a bird, fly around... 250, 300 feet in the air thorn and whip. use cantrips and use thorn whip to like, you could fly over this fortification and just be using thorn whip to rip people off the walls yeah. all day long. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me. I'm a flying chameleon. <laughs> yeah. And if you're like a sparrow, a sparrow, 300 feet in the air, ain't nobody going to be able to shoot you down. <laughs> exactly. No, you're fine. You're invincible. I love it. Yeah. And then at 20th level with Archdruid, Archdruid got a glow up as well. So if you roll initiative and you don't have any wild shapes left, you get a use of wild shape. Okay. No, I, again, I like it. And it also improves on the wild resurgence feature. So the spell slot to a wild shape, wild shape to a spell slot. It improves on that. They didn't go into detail on what that improvement was. They just said that it improves. gets an improvement. I'm sure that that article is probably going to come out in the next like. Two I don't weeks. know because all of those articles were from July. Oh, well, like a month ago. They totally missed then. <laughs> yeah. Well, they did an article on the changes to Wild Shape. Yeah. But that was specifically the changes to Wild Shape. They didn't do the whole class. Gotcha. Which is a bummer. It, it is, but again, very happy to see a lot of these changes. I think druids are going to be a lot of fun. I know druids were. Um, actually used less than rangers in fifth edition and that was one of the reasons they really wanted to go through and beef them up a bit is to get more players to play the droid because it was a little neglected yeah a little bit okay moving on to the next class fighter 
at first level, you gain access to the fighting style feats because fighting styles have now become feats. That is one thing they have come up with with the new rules is they are definitely beefing up the feats and there's a lot more available. And that was something from third edition I had greatly missed. And so I am happy to see feats looking like they're going to be something used again. Yeah, I think there's like 75 feats now. Yeah. Which is great. But all of the fighting styles have become individual feats. So if you have access to the fighting style feats by having fighting style in your class, you can pick which fighting style you want. You're not limited to a specific window of these are the fighting styles you have access to, depending on your class. Right. And then at first level, you also get second wind. Second wind has been modified to be more of a resource that you spend as opposed to just being a way to regain a few hit points. So you start off with two uses at first level and you actually gain more uses as you level up. And that makes the players a bit more tactical, which I enjoy. Yeah. And there are other abilities that you get later on that you can spend a second wind use in order to get an additional effect. Yeah. And then also at first level, you gain access to weapon mastery. So you get to choose three weapons because you're a fighter to get the weapon mastery properties of. And you can change which weapons you get the mastery features of at the end of a long rest. And you gain access to more properties as you gain levels. Again, for a fighter, that feels correct. I mean, this is this is their bread and butter. This is what they do. So they should have access to most of these. Starting at second level, you get Tactical Mind. This is where I was talking about spending your second wind as a resource. So starting at second level, you can use second wind to gain 1d10 to add to a failed ability check. Okay, nice. And if you still fail after you roll that d10, you don't lose your use of second wind. Oh, I like that. So it's it's like a beefier version of inspiration. A, a bit. A yeah. Bit. At fifth level, you get tactical shift, so you can blow a second wind to move half of your speed without provoking an attack of opportunity. I like that this this works better than, you know, using a dash or something like that, especially if you have to get through a bunch of nasty stuff. Not taking four attacks of opportunity is always a good thing. Yeah, it basically is a an improved disengage. Yes. And so... At ninth level, you get the Indomitable feature. It has been reworked a little bit from the original version. Now, whenever you re-roll your saving throw, you get to add your fighter level to the result. Ooh, I like that. Which means that it only gets better as you level up. Yeah, no, I, I like that. That sounds very useful. And it gives you that very gritty sort of don't stay down Indomitable yeah, you kind of get that whole it. Rocky Balboa feel. Yeah. <laughs> also at ninth level, you gain Tactical Master. So you get to have the push, sap, and slow weapon mastery properties, regardless of what weapon you're wielding. Now, with that, will those properties stack? So like, could no, you, have you like... still you can still only use one property per attack. Okay, making sure. However, if you happen to have, say a maul that has the topple ability you can choose to use topple or push sap or slow whichever is the most advantageous for you at any given time right no i like that but the thing my brain immediately went to is like use cleave and slow or cleave and topple would be oh (laughs) that would be a lot no you can't stack them like that On the same attack. So close. You can stack them like that on multiple attacks. Yeah. But not on the same one. And then at 13th level, you get studied attacks. So basically, whenever you happen to miss a creature with your weapon attack, you get advantage on your next attack against that creature. Again, for a fighter, that makes sense. Yeah, it's basically a, I read what you did. And so I have better insight on what you're doing so I know how to react to that. Yeah, no, again, that feels like, again, you have like boxers or things like that where they kind of go or like if you had like a duelist, you know, and they they learn, 
okay, well, my opponent reacts this way each time I go for this move. So you adjust. Yeah, it thematically it fits. I love it. And I didn't see anything about a capstone ability. So well, I guess fighters just don't get a capstone ability. Oh, does it come with perhaps their subclass? No, I mean, the capstone ability is a third attack on your extra attack. Oh, I mean, that's, oh no, a, a third attack. Or, or your fourth attack, sorry, your fourth that's, attack on yeah. your extra attack. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm I mean, assuming that, that because it wasn't listed in the article, that just means that it didn't change. Change, fair. So, but yeah, that's the fighter. Yeah. <laughs> so I think right here, again, just because there's a lot to go to, and we have like half our classes left, we're going to go ahead and take a break. And we're going to finish this up on not quite our next episode because we do have Traskmas coming up, which we're excited about. But yeah, um, Traskmas, and, which is also our anniversary. Huzzah! So that'll be four years, four years of us doing this podcast. I know. Looking back, I'm like a little amazed. I've enjoyed it immensely. It's been a lot of fun. And to our listeners, thank you. But we are planning on doing a one shot with some guests coming up, which will be a lot of fun. And we will cover the remaining classes on the episode following that. Yeah. So for our upcoming episodes, because I'm already planning on splitting it into two episodes, we're going to be having Michael Ross coming back. As I have mentioned before, Michael's book, Action 12 Cinema, was nominated for an Emmy this year for Best Rules. And I happen to be the editor for that book. So we're going to have Michael coming back and we're going to play a game of Action 12 Cinema for our Excellent. anniversary. And we're also going to be having Rob Hilferty from World Build With Us come along and play with us. Always so the, the four of us are going to play together. And the game itself is sort of designed in such a way to make it fairly easy to split up into a two part episode because the premise of Action 12 Cinema is you are planning and performing a B-budget action movie. This is going to be so much fun. (laughs) And so you have two phases of the game. You have the pre-production phase, which is where you establish what the movie is going to be. And then you have the production phase, which is you going through the movie. And so it's going to be split into two episodes. The first episode is going to be the pre-production. The second episode is going to be the production And I'm going to try and get it all together to get it out on the Wednesdays that bookend Tarasmus, because Tarasmus is like on a Saturday this year. So that would mean that the first one is going to come out on the 4th, which would be a regular release episode day. And then the second one will come out on the 11th. Perfect. So, yeah, that's our plans. Hopefully we actually are able to do the recording unlike last year where we were going to be recording our one shot with of mice and men and monsters and that just fell through because everyone had life happening life does happen we may still try and get that together at some point but i'm not holding out a whole lot of hope for that (laughs) at this point but we might and it'll be fun yeah so anyway thank you everyone for joining us today if you have any comments, suggestions, or ideas, please send us an email under common taste at gmail.com or come join us on our Discord and ask us in the server. You can find a link to the Discord along with links to all of our social media, our TikTok, our YouTube, our Twitch, all of that over at undercommontaste.com. Uh, you can also find links to our itch store, undercommontaste.itch.io, where you can find our liminal horror adventure beneath the lake or my solo RPG forever home and our Patreon page, patreon.com slash under common taste, where you can come and become a patron of the show and help support us financially. Excellent. If this is your first time hearing us, we're so glad you found us. You can find our podcasts on the podcaster of choice. As always, give us a rate and review. Uh, This helps increase our visibility and lets us know what you want to hear more of. And if you join me, I think we're going to move our schedules to Tuesdays and Thursday evenings, but I will be doing a playthrough of the uh, 1990s game classic uh, Neverwinter Nights. And so I'm going to do a random character generator by roll of dice to figure out class and character. And we are going to start that probably in the upcoming week. Sounds good. All right. Thank you again. Stay safe, everyone. And we will see you in two weeks when we start playing Action 12 Cinema. Happy gaming.
Thanks for joining us for another episode of Undercommon Taste. Our theme song is Massacre Anne, written and performed by Mary Kroll and used with permission. You can find Mary online at marycroll.bandcamp.com or on Patreon at patreon.com slash drmarycroll. Our logo is by David Sutherland. You can find more of David's work on deviantart.com slash David Sutherland or on instagram.com slash willx underscore 73. We'll be back in two weeks, so stay safe, and we'll see you then.